Today's episode of Socially Democratic is presented to you by Dunn Street. Dunn Street is a progressive campaign agency that specialises in community organising. We partner with businesses, organisations, unions and social democratic parties across the globe to develop community organising strategies and train leaders to build power from within their community. And in 2021, Dunn Street will continue to work with folks that want to share their stories inspire others, take action and organise communities for change. To find out how you can partner with Dunn Street, hit us up at dunnstreet.com.au. Today's podcast is also presented to you by Morris Blackburn Lawyers. Who knew that using a different coloured pen could make a will invalid or that removing the staples means the document is no longer legally recognised? I actually didn't know that. Morris Blackburn's expert lawyers know all the important tips and making and make creating a will easy simply complete the online form and they'll arrange a time to discuss your needs prepare your will and store it at no extra cost search morris blackburn wills today to get started on your affordable lawyer written will hello to all of our new listeners and subscribers who found us via our recent episode with Premier Dan Andrews, and welcome to another episode of Socially Democratic, your weekly centre-left politics and organising podcast that's out each Friday and dives into the progressive campaign issues um, of the day and the people leading them from home and abroad. And what a week it has been uh, for Socially Democratic. We've gone from being a little-known left-wing podcast to the number one ranked uh, politics podcast in the country and many thanks should go out to Paul Sakal for misquoting the Premier's remarks on our show and putting the story on the front page of The Age and then Rachel, Rachel Baxendale who needed to get shit off the liver and complained on Twitter about the lack of uh, airtime that she gets to ask questions of the Premier after she just spent basically about 150 days in a row with a daily two-hour press conference um, with the most accessible political leader in our nation's history to which uh, you good folk then spent all of Sunday um, shit-canning her tweet and sharing our episode with the Premier, which has meant that we've got thousands of new listeners, and that's so cool. So to all of our new listeners, we say welcome. Uh, We really hope you enjoy uh, the podcast. Uh, Please go back and check a whole bunch of our old episodes. Please subscribe to the show um, and uh, give us a rating and leave us a review if you use uh, Apple Podcast. Um, And to all of our regular listeners that we've had since uh since this journey first began Folger Teresh welcome back on this week's episode we are joined by two wonderful people we did this exactly 12 months ago and we're going to do it again today Uh, we're going to wrap uh federal politics for the year 2021 and to help me do that we're going to be joined by the Labor uh federal member for the seat of McNamara Josh Burns and Labor's federal member for the seat of Lilly which is in the suburbs of Brisbane Annika Wells. So those two wonderful human beings will come on today to unpack what's been a pretty crazy year in federal politics. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Stitcher. And if you like the show, let us know. Leave us a review, as I said before, on podcasts, uh, Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. And for all the updates about the, uh, about the pod, follow Dunn Street on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn. Dunn Street is D U N N. S T R double E T. Okay, let's get to today's episode. Okay, we're taping this one on a Monday morning in Melbourne. Who thought it was a good idea to do a podcast first thing on a Monday morning? Um, but uh, to help me get through. Uh, today's episode, uh, although it took us a while to get started because we had some technical issues, uh, are two wonderful human beings uh, who were on this time last year to wrap up uh, 2020 in federal politics, and they're going to—they've clearly enjoyed it so much that they've come back again. <laughs> uh, the member for the federal member for uh, Lily uh, Annika Wells, welcome back to Socially Democratic. Good to be with you, Stephen Donnelly. And the federal member for McNamara, but it'll always be Melbourne Ports in my heart. Josh Burns, welcome back to Socially Democratic and happy Hanukkah. Stephen, as if we had a choice, as if we could say no to you. 
a little bit. When you sign your pre-selection form, there's actually a box you have to tick saying that you will go on socially democratic whenever summoned for the duration of your parliamentary career. You you either you either pay your tithe or you go on socially democratic. <laughs> <laughs> There's no options. Very good. Now we are going to do a review of the year. Before we do that, though, I, I, I am interested in getting your thoughts on both of the moment that you know on Hogmanay on New Year's Eve when the clock strikes 12, 1 or you know, twelve o'clock, uh, as we left twenty twenty and went into twenty twenty one and. You were probably at some party and a whole bunch of people saying, thank God, 2020 is over. Glad to see the back of that. Were you the kind of person that was like, yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. And I think that I have positive hopes for 2021. And I'm thinking more so in terms of COVID and all that kind of stuff. Or did you sort of think in the back of your mind, you know what, I think that um, this pandemic isn't aware of the calendar year and the Christian um, you know, calendar and probably will linger around and continue to be a bit of a challenge for us going forward. Um, Annika, what were your thoughts on, on New Year's Eve as we headed into the new year? Well, bless you for thinking I was at a party with um, <laughs> revellers. <laughs> um, I think the twins were six weeks old at that point. So I was, um, if I was awake at midnight, it was 10 and breastfeeding. Um, I, I remember we booked um, a little getaway um for this new year's eve week this year 45 minutes from brisbane so obviously on some level i was not confident that things were going to be back to a blissful open state mm. this year and i think on the ground it is very evident the pandemic's not over because all of the services and all of the community centers are still dealing with um months and months backlog of people who need assistance arising out of the pandemic, even before you introduce things like um, when the boosters are coming in, whether we've got supply for boosters, when the international borders are opening, et cetera. So, no, I think the fog of the pandemic never really lifted for us here. Josh? Well, what a raging night my New Year's Eve was. <laughs> uh, no, I, I was on the couch uh, and my daughter was was upstairs asleep and i was watching some really cruddy television from memory uh, and it was it was a it was great i i remember a sense of a, a bit of trepidation much like annika that people especially in victoria were were kind of at one hand people were hopeful that the worst of the pandemic was behind us but on the other hand i think a part of us all knew that it wasn't and that that even though Victorians had done something pretty remarkable at that stage of drive, the number of cases down to zero, uh, it was still this looming, this looming thing that that cases were still escaping out of quarantine. There was a case in Brisbane. There was, you know, there was holiday plans were sort of thrown into disarray, and uh, and yeah, we were our plans were were shifted. So we ended up spending a week in on a on a host farm in in regional Vic, which was just fantastic. Uh, and, you know, collecting eggs and feeding horses and going to see the wildlife farm in Ballarat, which has a tiger. Uh, for those of you who haven't been to Ballarat's wildlife farm, check it out. Part uh, of the natural biosphere of Ballarat. That's right. That's right. Although they've kind of got wallabies, platypus and a tiger. So, you know, it's, it's all of the Australian wildlife, but, but I do, in all seriousness, I do remember feeling like, a bit of hope, but also this this understanding that we're still in the middle of it. And and you know, Stephen, I I really wish that that had changed now. But I, I kind of am still I still feel like this thing's got a bit of a way to go. And and I, I but I, I do think people are are a bit tired. A uh, couple of things to pick up on that. First one: collecting eggs and feeding horses. Were you in the plot of an Enid Blyton novel by any chance? <laughs> you know. My daughter was was two and a half, and and collecting eggs was a whole hour of activity. And and although although we did give her the bucket to carry back to the farmhouse, and or the basket, and let's just say a few of them were a little scrambled by the time <laughs> by the time we got back to the farmhouse. She wasn't the sturdiest of all walkers, but but you know that's something we can improve on. And uh, and. 
it was, but it was great. It was at that time. It was actually Melbourne. If you remember, Melbourne and regional Victoria had had this whole period during winter completely separated. So um, all of our all of our local bed and breakfasts and other things were were only just really opening up, and 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 they really needed a, a bumper summer. And I think they got one last year because all of the Victorian tourists ended up just staying in Victoria, which was really good for our our regional economy. Uh, but yeah, we had a, we had a absolutely brilliant time we're about 20 minutes out of Ballarat and it was it was sensational let's turn to the major issues that um, grabbed our attention throughout 2021 and opening up with a pretty ordinary issue that um, came to the fore um, out of Canberra really um, which was this the revelation of um, you know this toxic culture and the way that uh, women staff um, are and were treated um, in Parliament with uh, and it came to like the story of um, Brittany Higgins. Uh, Annika, I just want to um, get your initial reflections on uh, that when you first heard about the story about Brittany Higgins um, mm. and, um, and you know, you, you've been a staffer as well. In fact, I think you and I may have spoken about this that this year. Have we done that? I can't remember. I've had, we've done 53 shows and they're all starting to blur into one, but I feel like I've had a conversation. No, I haven't, I haven't been with you since this recap last year. Um, what were your thoughts? So I, I don't know what you're thinking. <laughs> what were your, what were your um, thoughts when you first heard, heard, heard the story about Brittany? Well, I think one of our um, colleagues summed it up best when I came back to Parliament this year. Uh, after parental leave for the Women's March, and they said, welcome back. We work in a crime scene. We, Our workplace is an actual crime scene. And unfortunately, I think it has been like that for decades. But this particular story, when Brittany Higgins came forward, um, really lit the tinderbox and has now produced the Jenkins report. Um, which 1,700 people contributed to, which I think is no small feat when you think about what it is to um, either write a submission or um, attend a meeting or a Zoom and talk about those sort of horrifying experiences, but to, to, to be brave and to do it anyway in the hope of contributing to a safer workplace and a better democracy, because it's not just any workplace. I just want to credit all 1,700 people who did do that this year in the hope that we would um, get something better out of it. Um, the message of the report is that everybody working in the building has to lift their standards of behaviour um, and an extraordinary level of bullying and sexual harassment was described and we've got to do something about it. What I worry is, um, based on form, where the Prime Minister had the Respect at Work report, which signalled all of these things broadly, sat on it for 15 months, put it in a drawer, hoped it would go away, only addressed six of those 55 recommendations when absolutely forced to when Brittany Higgins first came forward, that he's very much hoping that we all forget about this across the summer and it isn't something that he has to address. I think it's one of those classic examples of, of he's choosing to vacate the space. A leader would say, right, this has happened. It's happened on my watch. Maybe I'm not personally responsible for all of it. Maybe my political party isn't personally responsible for all of it, but it's the parliament that I lead, so I am going to lead the solution. Whereas all we saw from Morrison last week was him saying, right, well, this is everyone's problem, isn't it? Everyone's got a mess here, and it's on all of us collectively, gestures vaguely around the building to fix it, but nothing concrete, nothing tangible um, so far. And it, it has me really worried. Uh, Josh, the response by Morrison at the time, um, were you surprised by, you know, the, some of the remarks that um, Annika just made there about them trying to brush under the, under the carpet? Um, how, how would you critique Morrison's response to um, the, the, the handling of Brittany's um, complaints? I, I think Annika put it really well, Stephen, and I would share her concerns about Morrison and, and one of the examples I think if we cast your mind back I, I was outside the parliament on that incredible day where women marched on the parliament and uh, and Brittany Higgins who originally was was not meant to turn up to the protest did turn up and there was this there was this 
incredible energy and uh, determination from the thousands of women who turned up on the floor, on the steps of Parliament. And when Brittany spoke, her, her uh, it, it was one of the most memorable and powerful speeches I have ever ever witnessed. And and there was a moment there, there was a real moment there where I think the Prime Minister, as Annika quite rightly uh, referred to, could have met that moment, and he could ha he could have uh, he could have grasped it. And instead, you remember his reaction was to say in the federal parliament after Brittany Higgins did her speech was that such marches, uh, not in Australia, but around the world are met with bullets nearby. Yeah. nearby. And, and I think that downplaying and that, that, that attempt to, um, to tell women that you should be appreciative of how things are, not what they should be, was significant and it reflected his attitude uh, to the to the broader issue, so I, I, I have great concerns about his ability to manage and even understand fully the implications of of his attitude to this, uh, and I have no confidence in his ability to uh, to change it. Nor do I have any confidence in his willingness to change it. So it is a real concern, and uh, yeah, I think Annika was spot on in her summation on it. And what an you know. If that, if you think about it, if, if Albanese was prime minister and these revelations came about, you know, under a Labor government, you know, what a terrible uh, piece of information to be confronted with. But the fact that instead of actually meeting that moment and going, right, well, we need to, we need to do something about this. And in fact, it's not just Brittany, but obviously clearly this is happening throughout this workplace. And this is something we need to address and, sh and not just do it in a performative way, but actually let's create systemic change but for the Morrison government to just really kind of say let's just ride this out you know let's just try and deal with this and what we, I found was remarkable was it really I think it dragged on longer than I think that they thought it was I think they looked at it as a how can we solve this as politically but and maybe this will be a two or three day story and we're done but it wasn't because it really did it set the I think it set the tone for 2021 in which Morrison has had a shit year and they just got this so horribly wrong. And I think they completely misread the mood in the community. And to your point, Josh, about the remarks about the march, like it was just like, oh, mate, you are on another planet. Annika, what are your thoughts about how has this de defined the Morrison government for 2021? Well, like you said, um, I remember at the, at the march, um, the people that had turned up, um, you know, it was such a, people had driven five hours and pulled their kid out of kindy for the day because they wanted them to be there for what sort of women and many um, allies, men, understood innately was going to be one of those days in history um, for decades to come. And for Morrison not even to cross the threshold of the building to meet with all, do you remember that he only agreed to actually meet with them day of when it mm. was um, clear that there were thousands of people massing on the mall? And I think I agree with you, Stephen. It gives away the kind of men who run Morrison's office that they collectively missed this and that they collectively thought this is something that we could ride out. Whereas anyone, any woman who's worked in the building, if if there was women of senior enough rank in that office. Um, women that the Prime Minister listened to, they would have been able to say to him, this is not something that you're going to be able to piff off into the long grass. This is not a two-day story that you can write out. This is something that you are going to have to address. Something that haunted me, one of the women at the march said to me, can you imagine if Labor had won the 2019 election and it had been Prime Minister Shorten and Deputy Prime Minister Plibersek who had been in charge when this story came to light and what would have been done with the respect at work report and how we would have responded to this. I, I believe that Labor would have met the moment. Um, and I just hope that now we know the federal elections next year, um, that an Albanese Labor government can be the ones who actually 
um, addresses the recommendations in the report. They're good recommendations. If you had a if you have a read of them, um, there's been really good suggestions from people who've worked in the building. Something that's always thrown around is, oh well, you know, parliamentarians are elected by 110,000 constituents. They can't be sacked for bad behaviour. They've got to go to the election. But there are sanctions in the recommendations. Things like cutting your budget. Um, things like docking travel allowance that actually um, do put a break on behaviour where currently there is there is no break and even just the, the implementation of something like that, it's going to get around. People are going to hear that there are people who have had their you know, budgets reduced or whatever for this kind of behaviour. So like there's really good tangible things that can be taken up um, uh, by the federal government. My hope at this point is that it's a federal Labor government that gets to do it. Let's turn our attention to the next crisis that the Morrison government then stumbled into. And I don't mean for this review to just be a shit bagging of the Morrison government, but they just We're gave... totally fine if it is. We're totally <laughs> fine if it is. Yeah, there's so much material. Name one positive thing. Even if you tried to come up with some pink, fluffy, sparkly medal to give them, what would it be at this point? Yeah, we would struggle. It would be a very, very quick podcast. The, uh, the vaccine rollout or stroll out, as um, I think it was eventually named, um, was an absolute uh, disaster. And um, I just, uh, I don't even have a question for you because I just, Josh, I just want to get you, get you to riff off. I know you've spoken about this a lot uh, <laughs> and flying the flag flag on programs like Sky News. And the like. Yeah, I was going to um, say, I've heard Josh speak about this so much, I reckon I could do Josh's riff on this. Well, but actually, <laughs> maybe we might get anything from Josh. Who aren't me. <laughs> Josh, just, just talk us through, just talk us through uh, your reflections on how the Morrison government completely botched trying to vaccinate our people. I remember at the start of the year, the Prime Minister said that his number one job was to get Australians vaccinated. And what followed was every single day a complete and 100% uh, focus on political messages, not on actually getting the details right. And if that doesn't sum up this guy, then, then I don't know what does. Every single day he was focused on on, on telling Australians what he thought they wanted to hear, not on actually delivering the single most important uh, public policy, you know, since World War II. And, and, and to go through some of those details, if it weren't for the state premiers, including ma mainly Gladys Berejiklian and Dan Andrews, who were insisting, and also the Federal Parliamentary Labor Party that were insisting on setting up mass vaccination hubs because the way through the GP network, we were just never going to get there fast enough. Uh, as well as we were th throwing, like we were scratching the, the blackboard so many times saying, order more, you know, build in more insurance, get this done. And of course they didn't until it was too late. And what we had was, was, was Victoria and New South Wales have the only uh, OECD country to have a recession or a retraction in the economy in the September quarter uh, and, and so much pain and so much pain, not just economically, but for our own well-being in, in our two major states that could have been avoided. We, we look at where we are now and it is a full credit to Australians for going out and, and doing their bit and getting vaccinated. And, and they're going to get boosters as well. And we've got a new variants and other things to deal with. But, but what we didn't have was a federal government who had planned, who had done the work and who was focused on the detail, not the politics. And, and throughout it, the thing that was the, the, the biggest crime of it all was despite the complete failure of their own responsibility of making sure that this thing was watertight from, from the very beginning to the very end, uh, despite their failures of, of public administration, thankfully the states stepped in and actually helped deliver this thing through mass vaccination hubs and also the mandates, because that was a big reason as to why people got vaccinated, not because of Scott Morrison's uh, original plan. 
what was this constant sniping and playing politics during the pandemic. These people were, were you know, th these are the people who, who, who contribution to contact tracing was the app that still doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And they were criticising Victoria for contact tracing. Then in vaccinations, they were criticising the Victorian government for their really difficult decisions in order to manage the pandemic, pandemic in the best way possible without actually supplying the most important tool to get us through it. And I, I found it, I found it arrogant. I found it, uh, I found it insulting and I found it to be one of the most uh, nasty displays of governance um, that in, in our country's history by a group of people who had no reason to be arrogant, no reason to be nasty and should have shown the humility that their actual output deserved. And I'm keen to get your thoughts on this because you know, it really was a stroll out um, delivery. And I think the urgency kind of started to lift, certainly here in Victoria, when we entered into the most recent lockdown. And it became, became quite clear to us that um, we weren't going to get on top of the numbers this time, that it was just too great. And that the only way we we're going to get out of this was through um, putting jabs in arms. And that became the sort of the thing. But what's the experience been like in Queensland uh, and in terms of both urgency, but also the delivery of vaccines to Queenslanders by the federal government. I mean, how have you found that um, that relationship between Morrison and say the Bly uh, and the um, and Palaszczuk government uh, with, 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 you know, the coordination of trying to get uh, the vaccine to, into the arms of Queenslanders? Yeah, well, Queensland experienced vaccine shortages for months on the back of the Morrison government's failure to procure sufficient vaccines at the earliest possible time. Um, I haven't forgotten that Greg Hunt ignored Coro from Pfizer about getting more um, Pfizer into Australian shores. I haven't forgotten that um, Pfizer and other companies said that they had every other head of state on the phone multiple times trying to shore up supply for their countries and Scott Morrison couldn't lift the phone. How many calls did he make for Matthias Cormann to tee up that OECD gig? Was it 42? 42 calls to give it, get, make sure that his mate got an international posting, but not a single call for vaccine supplies to Australia. Shows his priorities. I think, um, I mean, Queensland escaped any kind of um, long lockdown for which we are very grateful, but um, we do have vaccine hesitancy up here. And there's probably about, about a 10% rump left at this point of people who are hesitant about the vaccine and, and they are making those decisions as we head towards what is meant to be. I think they're updating this today, but at the moment it's meant to be a 17 December opening of the borders. And um, the Prime Minister is, is the person who has allowed misinformation to flourish, a, a nourishing vaccine hesitancy. And the Prime Minister has allowed that misinformation to flourish from his own people, from his own senators, from his own MPs. And to look at that through a really cynical lens, he's doing that because he wants their vote or their preference at the election, because he knows that this 10% rump of protest votes um, vote Palmer or they vote One Nation or they vote um, up here, Campbell Newman, um, who's running again this time. And he knows that if he lets those people um, think that they're voting to blow up the government, they're voting against the whole show, um, they're voting, you know, um, they're voting Palmer to, to send all of us a message, he will get their preferences because that is what the Palmer How to Vote tells them to do. So I think it's infuriating. It's, it's that he uh, is allowed to do this. He isn't held to account more for it and that he architects a regime where um, he thinks, he encourages people to think that they're um, blowing up the system by giving a vote to someone like Clive Palmer when actually they're ensuring that Scott Morrison remains the Prime Minister. And that is a very live um, issue for us um, for the federal election, particularly, I mean, a seat like mine has about a 10% protest vote. Um, so what, what those people choose to do, um, Morrison's playing footsie really deliberately with them. Um, and it's something we're going to have to work on. Um, we're going to have to spend money telling people that's what's happening and um, letting people know that a vote for Palmer is a vote for the status quo 
um, or a vote for One Nation or a vote for Campbell Newman is a vote to keep Morrison in power, not a vote to blow up the show. I want to get your thoughts on this, Annika, because I've just been thinking about this over the last couple of uh, days. Certainly the experience here in Victoria with the Victorian state libs is they're, they're also playing footsies with this anti-vaxxer constituency, which in the end I think will make up probably uh, as a voting block will be about 5% of the entire Victorian electorate. If you were to frame an election in which you're pitting yourself as a either a pro-vax party or an anti-vax party, and the pro-vax party then has got the ability to pull out 95% of the electorate and the anti-vax party can only get five, you're in a you're in a you're in some serious shit if you want to try and return some seats. We all know that because we have compulsory voting, you need to appeal to the center. Um, Morrison, is he being a little bit too clever here by trying to play footsies with this sort of ra radical far right or just anti-vax community and not take care of his centre? Because there could be a scenario in which a lot of voters go, well, I didn't realise that the Liberal Party were so keen on defending the rights of people who don't believe in vaccinations. Because I know the experience down in Victoria is that the, the, all these protesters marching up and down the streets of Melbourne, it's pissing everyone off. I, I know Liberal Party um, friends of mine who are going, I'm not even voting for the Woods this year, just because they'll sideline themselves with this group. And I wonder if Morrison's making the same mistake. He's probably getting a little bit too cute here. Or is he doing it because he needs to, because he's worried about his base? As in, is he worried about his core constituency? He might be losing some of those votes, so he needs to find new votes, which is have to be in this sort of, as, as you've listed, the Campbell Newmans and the One Nations and Cal, uh, United Australia Party, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. First principles, I would hope that doing the wrong thing will eventually get you some bad karma and some foul electoral consequences. So I hope that um, the Australian people will see through it and particularly, like you say, the sensible centre who want uh, life to return to normal and not to see their leaders play footsie with extremists for votes. Um, we will see, I guess, because Morrison has success doing this. I mean, look at the federal Liberals' approach to climate policy. They have people like Dave Sharma or Katie Allen or Tim Wilson out there calling themselves modern Liberals, saying they believe in the climate emergency, saying that they work in the team to secure climate action. And they have Keith Pitt and Matt Canavan, in, they sit in the same party room, out there calling for nuclear plants and saying that climate science is a hoax and they're not convinced um, of the science. And they all sit in the one party room and that is an acceptable spectrum for the Federal Liberal Party to be expressing um, as the one electoral platform. And you know, consider the experience, someone like Josh or I said, four words outside the Labor electoral platform, we would get a you know, rookie MP, contradicts Labor, trouble in paradise um, okay. story immediately from certain um, corners of the of Ozpol. So I, I, was, I make that point because he has success in doing it. They continue to do it in the climate space. So why would he not try it in this space if you are someone without any kind of values and will do anything to win at this point? I'd also make the point that Morrison has told his party room numerous times now that it is a narrow track to victory. And by that he means, you know, whatever it takes to win the six or seven seats at play is what he will do, whether or not it contradicts the national message, whether or not it lifts up our country, whether or not it is best policy or good practice or um, a forward moving righteous thing to do for the country. He doesn't care. He's just there to win those six or seven seats. And, and if he thinks that that particular percentage of protest vote would affect the outcome in Chisholm, that's what he'll do. Josh, is Morrison playing a dangerous game here? Uh, uh. He is, he, Annika is spot on. He is, he is dogmatic about winning and he will do what he thinks to win. It doesn't matter how divided the country gets. But, but uh, uh, taking a step back, I, I also think he has a big problem in some of those inner city seats where the more he appeals to the rural or, uh, or regional parts of his base via people like Barnaby Joyce and Matt Canavan and others who are seeking to undermine the importance of some of the issues that people legitimately feel in other parts of the country, 
he alienates people in the city and I think that's why we're seeing uh, we're seeing a real groundswell of of people who who are not liberal uh, and who are who don't recognize the Liberal Party anymore. Now, is that the, the long-term solution to our politics, to have a whole lot of sort of quasi-Diet Coke liberals in the parliament, like, um, um, you know, people who are former members of the Liberal Party who are now sitting on the crossbench? Uh, I mean, I, I'm not sure. I believe in Labor governments, and I believe that our country is better and fairer and stronger for having Labor governments, uh, not for having sort of Diet Coke liberals sitting on the crossbench. Um, but... But I, I think, regardless, it does tell you that 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 the Liberal Party is unrecognisable to many people in the city. That the people who voted for Peter Costello are taking a good, hard, long look at the federal Liberal Party and seeing if they want to vote for them again in Higgins. And I think I think Labor is a real shot to win the seat of Higgins. Uh, people. People, uh, you know, it will be tight. Uh, there are only really two people who can win the seat of Higgins. That's Katie Allen and our uh, brilliant candidate, Dr. Michelle Ananda Raja. Uh, and, and, and it will be really tight. Uh, but we are a chance to win it because of that exact reason, that, that the Liberal Party is unrecognisable to many people in the city. So I think, I think that Morrison, Morrison, you know, this has been a difficult political conundrum for the Labor Party as well. We have to find unity across the country. Uh, but, but government is hard, Stephen, and we all know how hard it is to govern. In Victoria, we don't govern by winning seats in the city. We govern by winning seats across the entire state. Daniel Andrews is, is the Premier of Victoria, not just because he holds seats in inner city Melbourne, suburban Melbourne, but also in regional Victoria as well. Uh, we don't hold government in Victoria without Ballarat, Bendigo, Geelong, uh, and other parts. Um, and we don't, uh, we don't, we won't win government unless we're able to unify people across the country. And I think that's a great challenge, but also, uh, but also something that 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 if we are able to think through it, and we are able to unite the country, then we are worthy of government. And I think that's one of the the, the exciting but also difficult things of being in the Labor Party is that we, we seek to be that unifying factor across the country. And sometimes we get it right and sometimes we don't. Morrison isn't seeking to be the unifying factor. He's trying to put us into so many different pieces that he kind of stumbles across the line and gets there because it's in so many fracturous paces that, that, that the cards kind of land in his favour. So it's, 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 a, it's a complex electoral picture, but I, I still have hope and optimism that we can we can and we'll find our way through it. Turning to economics for a moment, JobKeeper uh, ended in March this year, uh, well before New South Wales and Victoria went into a longer uh, winter lockdown. Annika, your thoughts on the decision by the federal government who are always trying to uh, 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 tout their economic management, leaving so many vulnerable Australians exposed during a global pandemic, what were your thoughts on that decision made by Josh Frydenberg and the government? Well, if there was ever an example, a policy example, to blow up the mistaken belief that Liberals are superior economic managers, it would be their JobKeeper policy, which, you know, there were a lot of problems around the rules from the start. Um, I would cite people like the Donata workers um, at Brisbane Airport and other airports across the country who were excluded, university staff who were excluded, casuals who were excluded, the increasingly large proportion of our economy who work in the gig economy, um, people working in the arts who refused JobKeeper entirely, um, entire industries decimated because the government refused to accept advice or correct um, exclusions where they needed to. Um, and then subsequently, obviously, we've found out that JobKeeper was given to hedge funds. JobKeeper was given to investment banks. It was, it was used to pay executive bonuses, and and many of those um, executive bonuses have not been repaid to the taxpayer. Twenty-seven billion dollars in overpayments to firms that either didn't qualify or whose profits actually went up during the pandemic. And if those payments had been better targeted or if there had been a better system of checks and balances imposed by the Morrison government, um, 
then we would argue that many more Australians could have been assisted by JobKeeper instead of being left high and dry with no support, particularly like when you said, this pandemic rolled into an entire second year. Josh, I just want to get your thoughts on, on this and actually Annika, jump in when you want as well. The, the notion of uh, economic management and the way that we, uh, if you wanted to be the government, uh, and presenting an argument to the populace about how you can manage the economy and you know keep uh, the deficit low and have a budget and surplus and all that kind of stuff has meant that labor all through the 2010s is it really had to try and work out how the hell do we do all these spending programs whilst at the same time not blowing the budget right um, and we we'll always get criticized that you know tax the labor party is going to be a high taxing government you shouldn't vote for labor party yada 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 and then all of a sudden <laughs> i feel like the rules have changed it's like as if they've it's like as if it's when they brought in the three point line into into the NBA. All of a sudden, everyone's just throwing it from downtown, right? Because all of a sudden, it doesn't matter. Cash is cheap. We're just going to blow billions of dollars wherever we like now. All of a sudden, and I don't think that this time around the Liberal Party can run that line on Labor going into election about how to spend money or how to spend taxpayers' money. I mean, has, are we playing in a new sort of economic? field now when it comes to the campaign uh, um, uh, the, the the myths of fiscal policy in this country are well and truly blown up to smithereens uh this is the highest taxing highest spending government in the history of our country and and if scott morrison thinks so little of australians that they don't he doesn't think they'll remember the fact that he has racked up a trillion dollars worth of debt then you know he's he really, it shows you how little he thinks of us, of the Australian people. I, I, I think that, um, I think that it is a big tool in their arsonry that is, that is no longer there, that they can't run this election on debt and deficit. I don't think that we need to run an election on debt and deficit because I don't think that people, I don't think it's, it's the first order of issue. I think, I think most Australians, uh, are, that they, they they are, there is a still a level of uncertainty about the future. There's still a lot of questions that we don't know. There's a lot of things for their businesses and their, whether it's, whether it's, you know, people to fill their roles or whether it is, uh, or whether it is, you know, having the, the health settings to enable people to come and use and utilize their businesses. I think there is a lot of uncertainty in the economy. I think what people want to hear from us is that we are going to manage that responsibly. If there are, if there is a need to inject money into the economy, of course we'll do it. But at the same time, uh, but at the same time, we seek to ensure that people who rely on services and who uh, are, are potentially being stymied by the current settings in the economy, things like childcare, things like wages, things like uh, secure work and the casualisation of the workforce. I think we we are building a really strong case to, to the Australian people in the Australian economy that says, look, these people are full of crap, right? Mm. They've, been, they've been telling this bullshit about debt and deficit for a decade, and they are the highest spending government in the history of, of, of our country. What they're telling you about how to run the economy is actually horseshit. And, and, and we don't need to play into their politics anymore. Put them aside for one second, and let's actually think about your family's future your family's security and the certainty that you and your businesses need. And I think that we can have a very compelling story about the future of work, the future of pay, the future of uh, gender equity in the workplace and the certainty that people are desperate in our economy. And you know, I, I think we can dismiss their, their, their ridiculous attacks on us. Um, and, and the final thing I'll say on it is, you know, it is telling that Morrison would, would attack the way in which Labor... I mean, if you asked him today, he would point blank say the way Labor managed the global financial crisis was reckless and irresponsible. He would, he would, he would tell you that lie to your face because he's so partisan over, over what is sensible and real. And I think we need to rise above that, Steve. And I really think this election and our big challenge as a Labor Party is to rise above his bullshit and to, and to uh, have confidence in ourselves and the Australian people that we can get this done and that we can manage the future of the economy and manage all of the future uncertainties because it is only the Labor Party that does these things properly and it is only the Labor Party that has set forward the sort of fiscal policy that has steered us in the right way throughout this pandemic and it will steer us into the future. In the 
2019 federal poll, I don't think I took the United Australia Party um, and their campaign seriously enough. Uh, and I think I've always been a bit of a sort of a centrist campaign snob. I, I mean, I, on election day, I like to talk to the people from um, the Citizens Electoral Council. They've got some wacky ideas. They're all pretty much insane. But, you know, it's a long day handing out on, on, a, on a polling booth and you need some fun. And sometimes I try and get them and the One Nation people to fight with each other. That would be fun. Um, but uh, you know how to party. yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, United Australia Party, I didn't take it seriously enough. Uh, clearly, they've got a lot of money and they've got a lot of you know, sort of they've dusted off the kind of the 1990s playbook uh, of campaign where they're just pumping a lot of money into, into sort of um, print advertising, TV advertising, um, texting, or which is, I guess, modern in some senses. Annika, how seriously do we need to take these guys going into the next into the next poll? Uh, should we be worried about the role that they're going to play in our in our, deciding the outcome of uh, who's going to be in government? Well, as someone who holds a seat with a twelve hundred and twenty nine vote margin that took ten days to count back and declare a winner out of the twenty nineteen federal election based on a high protest vote coming in. Uh, we should be taking this very seriously, uh, particularly in states like Queensland and Western Australia, where our movement always looks to, to pick up seats um, in states where we traditionally we've had far lesser federal seats than places like Victoria or New South Wales. As simply as possible, I think in 2016, Labor picked up the preferences of um, people voting Palmer um, and those other kinds of protest groups because we weren't expected to win. So we were still seen as a place to lodge a protest vote. In 2019, we were expected to win. Remember, sports bet cashed in 48 hours before the election even happened. So Labor was not seen as a place to lodge a protest vote. I think we have to acknowledge that there is a very, very high level of disenchantment with the state of politics in this country. And there is a very, very high level of dissatisfaction with politicians and their behaviour, um, evidence-based, to be honest. And people want to tell us that we need to do better. They want to, to protest vote. So, um, Someone like Clive Palmer with extremely deep pockets um, is a very dangerous thing. And he is very deliberately harvesting this sort of sense of people who are sick of lockdowns, sick of rules. Um, and where those people end up preferencing will determine a number of those six, seven, eight seats in play this election. And Whatever faux argument Morrison has with Palmer, whatever he is forced to say um, against Clive Palmer between now and the election, you watch how Clive Palmer's how to vote lands in in all seats really, but in particularly those those key seats. You watch where he suggests you direct your preferences. Now, happily. Um, a protest voter is not a homogenous group of people and something like 35% of them didn't vote the, the, the how to vote ticket last time. They preference Labor ahead of the Liberals in seats like mine, but it is not something that we should be dismissing or laughing off um, as um, a fringe group with no impact on the election. Um, they have a really big and powerful ability to change the outcome of federal elections. I want to turn our attention to uh, the submarines, um, but, but also I want to sort of um, talk about climate at the same time, because they, for some reason, all came together uh, when um, Morrison visited um, the city of my parents, Glasgow. And I will just say this, and there's a couple of Scottish people that listen to this episode. I didn't realise that there was a conference happening in Glasgow until a bit later on in the piece. And people get to talk about Glasgow. You know, when, when Morrison goes to Glasgow, I was like, why is Scott Morrison going to Glasgow? And when I think about Glasgow, I think about Celtic, I think about Iron Brew. Happy think, things. 
I, th- yeah, I think about fish suppers. I think about my aunties in smoke-filled land rooms watching the telly. And all of a sudden, our guys goes this sort of, <laughs> this is where climate, the future of our planet is going to be decided. It was quite remarkable. My brain couldn't get around it. But anyway, so first of all, Josh, with you, let's talk about the, the, the actual submarine deal in its first instance and then how it came to become an absolute diplomatic um, um, blow up second at Glasgow, and then, then thirdly, how it overshadowed uh, the actual what we were trying to achieve in Glasgow, apart from getting a good quality for supper. Um, but starting with you, Josh, talk us through just the sort of your take on the submarine deal in its in, in its isolation. In its isolation, well, you are right that they are all connected because they are connected by his fumbling and his inability to manage complex issues because he was entirely focused on the media story and the politics of the day. And that's what that's what he was he was so uh every detail of that announcement was focused on but not the actual detail of the policy and we're still seeing it in the way in which peter dutton is talking about it so in in, in its isolation what what this really is is a uh is a request by the australian defense force to increase our capability to withstand and and to withhold uh, areas of the Pacific against a, a fleet of a growing fleet of Chinese capability, really, uh, uh, and being able to defend um, our waters to the north of our country. Now, now there are there are legitimate defence uh, questions that 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 a, a, a you know nuclear powered submarine would be able to answer, and I think that Labor Party has been quite sober in. In thinking those things through and and being willing to work with the government on the comp- on the proviso that it doesn't result in a nuclear energy industry in Australia, it doesn't break any nuclear proliferation uh, uh, treaties that we are currently signatories to, uh, and most importantly that we 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 absolutely don't use it to acquire nuclear weaponry in Australia. That they are three really important conditions, and I think they are three sensible conditions. That if the government cannot stick with those three things, then we we don't support. This program, uh, and, and and there is still a lot of detail to be worked out. We've got eighteen months to try and think through some of those issues, uh, but 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 the problem with Morrison is that is that he wasn't he wasn't thinking about those issues, the reality, the details. He was so desperate to get up a story that he is the strong man looking to, looking to acquire nuclear submarines, and Peter Dutton is using this acquisition of nuclear submarines as some sort of justification to go out there and talk about an imminent threat that that is on our doorstep today by the chinese communist party that 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 we we kind of lose sight of reality and that reality is like, like it makes no sense that we would have submarines in the water in 20 to 25 years in order to protect this you know this looming threat that hangs over our head today what are we what are we saying to the chinese government you know, we're worried about you, but please take the next 20 to 25 years to allow us to up, upgrade our machines before you invade our territory. I mean, I mean, it's so ridiculous uh, that that it, it, it to use the politics and to lean into the politics of this way, frankly, is is um, is is a bit juvenile. So how, how we think through these things is important. Uh, and then because he was so worried about this announcement and not the actual diplomatic navigation that he needed to, because it meant obviously the cancellation of a $90 billion French submarine contract, Morrison, you know, got his press conference with Biden and Boris Johnson, but, but President Biden, but, but didn't tell the US, the, the French president. And in fact, we found out via a, very revealing article by the great Laura Tingle that he sent Emmanuel Macron a text message. Hey, Emmanuel, Scott here from down under. Uh, it's, not, it's not you, it's me. Uh, you know, that this is, this is the sort of high school breakup that this guy did with the French, which, which obviously resulted in uh, the French president being cheesed off and, and obviously resulted in him being annoyed. And rightly so. I think if that happened to Australia, we would have been, uh, res- we would have responded in exactly the same way. Have some respect for your friends uh, in, in, in and around our country. So I think uh, this whole story, and I'll, I'll end on this point, this whole story is a saga of the real and difficult challenges that face our area, that face our country. And do we actually want the guy who is so worried about what the story is in the newspaper that he forgets to actually do the leading and the governing? 
Do we want that guy in charge again? And I think the answer for Australia is no. What we need is a bit more honesty, a bit more humility, and a bit more of a willingness to actually do the hard work because this guy is leading us into a dangerous place with his willingness to play politics over being a leader of our country. Annika, I'm keen to get your... That was Josh's pitch for the PJCIS. How'd it go? <laughs> Annika, I'm keen to get your... The deputy, on. deputy chair. <laughs> deputy <laughs> assistant <laughs> vice secretary for the PJCIS. I will do the photocopying, whatever you like, team. <laughs> Annika, I'm keen to get your thoughts on your impressions or evaluations of Morrison on the global stage uh, and take in both the uh, the press conference that Josh alluded to when they made the announcement and, jo and uh, President Biden didn't know Morrison's name, all the way through to the uh, the events in Glasgow, because I just think that it's... Um, I, don't, I know that we don't win votes in in the back blocks of um, suburb and Brisbane and Melbourne on the performances of our prime minister at, at, a, at a, you know, in foreign policy, but it kind of goes to just who the kind of person he is. And I just really want to get your thoughts on, on how his performance was. Yeah, it actually makes me want to quote my brother-in-law and um, friend of the podcast, Brer Adams. It was all a bit untidy, wasn't it? It's was very <laughs> untidy, very untidy performance um, from the prime minister. Um, and it was, you're right, it, it did all seem to land at once. And I felt like I lost large clumps of my hair that fortnight fighting with Liberals about uh, how on one morning, the AUKUS morning, they can stand up and say nothing is more important than our international relationships. Our alliance with the US is the most pivotal and important thing that we have as our, you know, as a federal government. And we are so proud to be strengthening that relationship because it is so important. And then the next morning they can be saying, oh, well, Glasgow, you know, Labor's just worried about sucking up to their international friends on the global stage and who really cares about these global talk fests and what do we care if the French are angry at us? They're the French. Um, Labor shouldn't be so concerned with sophistry, with international uh, players. They should be focused on what Australians want. And the fact that they could say, they could talk out both sides of their mouth within the same news cycle really drove me very, very crazy and continues to because like you say, these things are important. No, we do not win votes in suburban Brisbane by what goes on in Glasgow. Um, I was, I think I had a really chockers week of, of events that week. And it, um, I talked to a lot of people about this and, and I think that's, I think that's right. And I think the prime minister was well aware of that. And that's why I was saying it in the first place. But I do think that what you do with your time in office leading the country is important and what, we decide in Glasgow is important and how that affects our relationships with our neighbours. For example, all of our neighbours in the Pacific is really important. And I think the Prime Minister squibbed it to get himself through another news cycle. And I don't think it's good enough. And I've had enough, to be honest. The other thing it reminds me of is the uh, one of my favourite documentary series is Labour and Power, produced by the great late Philip Chubb, which for anyone who's brought up in that sort of Hawke Keating era would, um, you know, if you're a politics nerd, you probably got a copy of Labour and Power somewhere in a VHS and it was like a double video pack, like it was huge. And there were some pretty big, heavy hitting interviews that were done for that documentary series. Um, George WH Bush is on that documentary series where he's talking about the relationship between the United States and, and, and Australia and the, and the great relationship that he had with Bob Hawke and over a whole bunch of different kind of things that are happening in the 80s. So that's pretty significant to get a former president of the United States onto a local ABC documentary, right? Could you imagine uh, Joe Biden, even if, would he do a document, would he give an interview for, an in, for, a, for a documentary about Australian politics when he doesn't even know the name of the prime minister in Australia? Thinking back on the foundations relationship between the pivotal relationship between Australia and the United States, it's just, it's so freaking embarrassing that I just can't, as, I, as you've said, uh, Annika, I just can't wrap my head around how pathetic it is. But anyway, I digress. Um, climate change. Last thing before we move into uh, our um, uh, yearly awards. Um, uh, climate has obviously sort of been that conversation that's 
trying to be the number one conversation, but it gets overshadowed by all the stupidity of um, everything else that's happening in in, um, in the world in the last 12 months. Um, but the Labor Party's obviously made a big announcement uh, over the weekend or just you know, late last week around um, our emissions for 2030. Um, I haven't got this question in your list, so you're going to have to just talk off on, on your feet, but I know that um, both, I just want, it did happen late, so I didn't have a chance to write a question about it, but I do want to get your reflections on it because obviously I don't think we talked about it, the environment when that Glasgow stuff happened because of all the fallout with Macron. Uh, and I just want to get your thoughts on, um, on that. And then maybe thinking about what the future looks like going into 2022 for Labor and for a future Albanese government. And I'll throw to you first, uh, Annika, and I'll come to you, Josh. Uh, I'm seeing Josh stretch his arms and wind up for a big swing on climate policy. <laughs> um, I think this one is um, a really difficult plane to land. I think that everybody who has worked really hard on this has done a really good job landing the plane because we know as progressive people that we have to act on the climate emergency and we have to do it in a way that is... Um, meaningful but also tangible and sensible in order to bring everybody with us because we can have the most beautiful climate policy going around if it sits at the bottom of a drawer in an opposition office and unfortunately that's been the case for us for too for too long so i feel good about it i feel good that so far the reaction has been good particularly from business communities that's a big difference big point of difference for us um, when we take the policy of the election compared to the scene in 2019. Um, the fact that we can now say business has confidence in our policy, the Australian Financial Review said it was the only credible climate policy in the country. Um, and I have every faith that the people working on it actually believe in the climate emergency and want to do something about it and that this is the policy that will get us to government to act. Um, I had a um, branch event yesterday with my branchies and people seemed pretty happy. So um, I'm looking forward to having constant argy-bargy with my Liberal opponent about two alternative policies for our climate future at the election. Yeah. Josh? Uh, the, the, the big things in our financial institutions are always done by the Australian Labor Party, Stephen. I mean, if you look back at the... Even, even if you go back as far as Howard, I mean, what are, what are the great financial reforms of the Liberal Party other than the GST? Like, like is, there, is there any structural reform to our economy? I mean, Frydenberg and Morrison have, have bring, brought in sort of minimal tax cuts to middle income earners that, that are already being used up and the economy has already gone backwards. So it's, you know, it's a short term policy, but it's not really the sort of long term structural reform that our economy requires. Climate change is the most important structural reform that we are going to have to do for our economy to be able to tap into global demand and tap into the expectation and the markets of, of not the next one, two, but five, 10, 15, 20 years. It was Whitlam who pivoted towards Asia. It was Keating who floated the dollar. And it's going to be an Albanese Labor government who uh, realign the economy to ensure that Australia doesn't miss out on a um, more renewable future. And with cheaper energy comes more opportunities for manufacturing, comes more opportunity for businesses. And the one thing that I'm really, really uh, proud of, of Chris Bowen and his team and Anthony who have done this work, is that this is detailed. This is not... This is not a press release that, that, that a minor party puts together. This is, this is policy that can legitimately uh, be taken to government and to, uh, to an incoming government and to the Treasury benches to be able to implement uh, that, that not only looks at where we're at and where we need to go, but also a commitment to strengthen the Climate Change Authority, to have them report to government annually. Uh, if you want to see where our intentions are, it's not only to do this because it's an irritant for five or six seats. It's we want to lead the world on this. We want to actually host the COP conference. We had Glasgow in COP26. We want Australia in COP29 to be on our doorstep and to be here and to actually have an Australian minister uh, to be leading the international negotiations and efforts to try and move the country forward. Uh, we could be... Uh, to climate change and renewable energy, what Saudi Arabia was to oil. It, it really is that important 
for our economy and the future of our country. And I think we are, as Annika said, we've landed the plane correctly. Uh, we've got uh, ambition, but we also have policy. Uh, and it is the most important structural thing that we can do for our economy to ensure that Australia actually is aligning ourselves with the demand of the next 10 years. So uh, I, I, think, I, think, I think people can have confidence in us. And I think that people uh, can be optimistic and hopeful about what our climate policy and our economic policy is going forward. Let's turn to uh, the awards section of today's uh, podcast. Last year, I think we handed out a couple of awards. Uh, I think we had Wookiee of the Year because you guys were sort of in your uh, infancies of your job, but now it probably feels like you've been there for a decade. Uh, <laughs> Old hats, old hats. Uh, but uh, so I thought we'd have two awards to do today. One would be sort of, uh, yeah, I guess, the, uh, the, the the Federal Caucus Member of the Year Award and then a Social Democrat of the Year Award, which would go to someone who's not actually an elected politician. Um, uh, Annika, I'm going to let you do the honours first and award your two uh, awards to your um, wonderful recipients. Sure. So my Federal Labor MP of the Year Award goes to Sharon Clayton who is the chair of our Federal Parliamentary Labor Caucus, and she is also the chair of the Labor Status of Women Committee, where we run all of our um, policy that affects women. Um, and obviously that's been a really important committee this year in light of everything that has happened. Um, it is a absolutely thankless task chairing caucus, um, having to herd all of the parliamentary cats um, and, you know, we have a very formal caucus structure um, and caucus committee process. And Sharon does it. She has the respect of everybody. She does it with such grace and aplomb. And she also ensures that the Status of Women's Committee and all of the issues that um, underpin that remain um, very much pivotal and at the forefront of our discussions as a whole. And she also is the Federal Labor Caucus member who has done the most work in making sure that Federal Labor's policies with respect to sexual harassment, putting in place mechanisms where you can go to to complain or to inquire about your rights or to commence processes. She has been that person doing that work for us um, as a Federal Labor Caucus. So she isn't someone who you'll ever see on Sky News. Um, and she deserves more um, credit and attention and um, applause than, than I think she gets. And I just love her. I'm the caucus secretary and I'm the secretary on the Status Women's Committee as well. So I get to ride shotgun with Sharon a lot around the, the building and it's an absolute pleasure to learn from her. So she gets my Federal Labor MP of the Year. Snaps to Sharon, well done. <laughs> um, am I going straight on to Social Democrat of the Year? Now you put brackets non-politicians, so I've spread my wings and I've got three options. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to Eugene Goodman, who you might remember is the Capitol Police Officer from the 6th of January riots. He's the one who stood down the mob, stared down the mob and guided them away from the Senate chamber at great personal risk. And he also um, steered Mitt Romney to safety, who was heading in the direction of the mob. And I think just on the principles of, um, you know, the sanctity of our democracy, upholding those central democratic tenets, that was um, an amazing action. So he was a contender. Um, I also wanted to nominate Simone Biles. Um, we, we had an Olympics this year, although it feels very long away now. She, I think, really redefined what it means to win um, and, and what winning looks like and set a really important example um, and particularly being a woman this year. Uh, so I think she gets a shout out as well, um, but I couldn't go past for us in Australia, Grace Tame, Social Democrat of the Year. Now I'd be at pains here to say that Grace is not partisan. She isn't affiliated with the Labor Party. Um, I don't know if she even um, calls herself a progressive, but I think that the values that Grace stands for and fights for are very socially democratic values. And I think the work that she has done and the attention that she has given to these causes has caused 
many, many ordinary Australians to consider their own values on these issues and, um, and to think about how those values align or do not align with their governments. So congratulations, Grace, with love from Annika. <laughs> Snaps to Grace as well, a courageous woman indeed, and a great list of social democrats there to, um, to lift up. Josh, over to you. Well, uh, I, I also had tame in my, in my uh, notes and I would just echo Annika uh, on, on Grace Tame. Uh, she speaks truth to power and does it in a way that is authentic and mind-blowingly uh, powerful. And uh, she, is, she has already and will continue to change our country for the better. So more power to her. She also liked one of my tweets, which was the highlight of my year. Um, I remember and, that. I remember yeah, that. It was very exciting. I can't remember what tweet it was, but but I, I, I got this little notification and I, I may have done like a little fist pump in the air. Um, <laughs> so, yes, that happened. So she's, that happened. She's, she definitely, um, but I do have one other that I'll come back to, but I just wanted to echo Annika. That is a fantastic nomination. Um, the ALP members, I'm going to go three of them, the, the team, the Northern Territory Labor team, uh, both, uh, which includes Luke Gosling, Warren Snowden and Malandiri McCarthy, who have all uh, um, faced a government who tried to take away a seat uh, for the Northern Territory and ran a campaign. I think we touched on this last year, uh, but they ran a campaign uh, and they have successfully from opposition, uh, they got the numbers uh, through some ragtags in the National Party, but that's, that's, uh, that's by the by, uh, to agree with them that the Northern Territory should have two seats. There's already a limit on representation in the Senate because they are a territory. Uh, and, and the three of them ran a campaign to ensure that especially the seat of Lingiari doesn't get abolished. Uh, and, uh, and that is going to be a very, it's not a seat we can take for granted. Uh, but to show you how uh, how nervous the government was about th those three uh, successfully advocating uh, for a, an extra seat, the Morrison government decided to bring in voter ID laws, which would basically have meant that Australians would have had to have shown their ID at the voting booth in order to cast a ballot, uh, which would have disenfranchised a lot of people in the Northern Territory. It, 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 if you were to look for a a piece of legislation to suppress the vote in Lingiari and other parts of the Northern Territory, that would have been it. Uh, it was a very, very cynical and ugly piece of legislation that, that, was, uh, that was as a, a direct result of the uh, two seats being won in Northern Territory. And yet again, the Northern Territory Labor team uh, stared them down and got that bill taken off the table, uh, again, with some good work done by Don Farrell and others. So uh, I would pay... Uh, homage to uh, our friends up the north uh, and say well done on two massive victories for the Northern Territory. Uh, not only did they manage to secure a second seat, but they also managed to stare down the government and get them to withdraw their voter ID bill uh, to ensure that um, everyone will have a chance to vote and that uh, there will be two representatives of the Northern Territory. So that is a fantastic result um, to our, two la our three Labor, amazing Labor representatives up there. And the only other person who I would add to Grace Tame would be Dylan Alcott, who I think uh, I think um, has has been a giant of Australian sport and uh, someone who is extremely authentic and who has uh, and who has demonstrated through all of his things what is possible. Um, and and if that isn't a little bit on the social democratic. Uh, um, angle, then I'm not sure what is. He 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 has been about what what we can be uh, and and what we what we aim to be, uh, and and doesn't get bogged down by uh, by some of the things that that constrain us in our day to day lives. And I think that is a a good shining star and a good northern star for us to follow um, to ensure that we uh, as we go into the next year and we go into the future we are. We are not just limited by what is, uh, but we, we imagine what can be and we put our heart and soul into it, just like what Dylan Alcott has done over many years uh, in a an, in an, uh, truly amazing career. Here, here. Annika Wells, Josh Burns, once again, it's been a pleasure. 
I think we're really over time today. I know you've probably got a whole bunch of pressing meetings that you're all running late for now, so I do apologise in advance for that. But it's been wonderful to see you both and uh, also wonderful to review uh, 2021. I wish you both a happy and healthy festive period and a um, successful 2022 in which we elect an Albanese Labor government, hopefully at some point in the early months of uh, 2022. I look forward to reading the controversial parts of this interview in The Australian. <laughs> Stephen, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Annika, always a pleasure, and uh, we'll see you both soon. Yeah, here's to a much, much happier 2022. Cheers, guys. Hey there. Thanks for listening to Social Democratic. Did you like the podcast? Hit the follow or subscribe button and be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. And to get all the latest updates on Socially Democratic, follow Dunn Street on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And we'll see you next Friday.